So we're starting a new, it's kind of like another mini sermon series. I think Harold and I are kind of uh, detoxing off of a eight month long sermon series. We're, we're doing like four message series, you know, like a five or sixer. And this is kind of an introduction to that. And I want to talk today, this morning about mystery. And it's about God's love and it's about Jesus and it's about the word of truth. And I want you to be encouraged by the things that you can be encouraged by. And know that in a lot of ways, not having a perfect answer at all times is really okay. It really is. A lot of people believe that because they don't have a doctorate level understanding of all things Jesus, that they're really disqualified from a lot of things. And that's just not the case. And I mean, I know me personally, I like a sharp answer as much as the next guy, especially when I think I got a really good question. But I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't want to be impressed by intellect nearly as much as I want to be loved and I want to be known. And I think that as a church, not that we're not intellectual, right? But we do a very good job of helping people understand that they're known and that they're loved. All right? So that is, that is my kudos to you. Now, growing up... <clears throat> One of the, the, once I started getting into reading, one of my favorite genres of books was uh, mysteries. I loved reading mysteries. And eventually, that, that turned into loving to write. But not necessarily mysteries, although I thought it'd be pretty cool to write a mystery. And I thought, wow, that's really shooting for the top real quick. I was like, that's got to be the hardest kind of book to write. So I'm trying to gather as much knowledge as I can. Like, how do you write a mystery? How do you write something like that? And one of the things that I acquired that a good mystery allows the reader or viewer, if it's like a movie or something like that, the ability to figure out the ending, figure out the answer, figure out the killer, figure out what the, the solution of the mystery is before you reach the end, right? That makes it a good mystery. If it's just something where you never had a chance to understand, then it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's a bad mystery. It has to be obtainable. It has to be something that can be grasped. It has to be something that you're always looking out for the bigger answer. It has to be something where you're paying attention to the details because those details are not pointless. Those details are not unimportant. And sometimes the stories will have like, you know, red herrings and things like that to purposely throw you off, but this is not the, the situation that we're in. So we're talking about a, a wonderful mystery sometimes. We're talking about a, a divine mystery that has an, an answer that we can't perfectly understand because we're not the Lord, but it's always worth looking into. Now, the most popular book ever sold is... The Bible, that's right. It's not allowed to be on the bestsellers list. Isn't that funny, right? Because the Bible is in like, I can't even say it's in a league of its own because it's really more of a, a galaxy of its own. Because like the second most popular book uh, is Harry Potter, right? And it's like, oh, 500 million copies. Wow, you know, people would line up. We, uh, you know, I, I remember I volunteered with Kelly and a couple of our friends to be at a Barnes and Noble. Uh, years ago, they were premiering another book that came out, and the kids would line up around the building because they were dying to know about this, you know, what, what, what happens in the story next. And you think, 500 million copies, that's a lot of books. But the Bible is somewhere in the 3.9 billion range, okay? It's, it's in a completely another galaxy. Nothing even holds a candle to it because Harry Potter, despite what some people might believe, is not the words of life, right? People love it because... It helps them understand. They feel like they, they, they understand themselves better by connecting to fiction. Although a lot of fiction takes a lot of its cues from the story of Scripture. The Scriptures are referred to as the greatest story ever told because it is. And a lot of the stories and fiction and media that we love has so many gospel shadows, gospel echoes to it because people connect to these stories about a hero that rises up in this age of evil, dies at the hands of evil, and then returns to save their friends. Now, <clears throat> Harold asked a lot of questions 
last time we preached. A lot of good questions. I couldn't even take them all down, right? But there are important questions that you're going to come across as you get involved in the messy lives of people, right? And one of those questions is, why doesn't God deal with evil, right? Whoa, right? And the answer to that question is pretty straightforward. He did deal with evil. He judged evil. Absolutely, absolutely judged evil. And he did it through the purpose, the person, through his purpose, the person of Jesus, right? So he judged evil. It's like somebody, they commit a crime, they commit a heinous crime, and, they're, and they, they get the death penalty. It's like everyone is guilty of death. Everybody is getting the death penalty. But because of Jesus, you can take, God, you can take advantage of God's forgiveness. God wants to redeem those that will put their faith and love and trust in the person of Jesus, that will put their trust in him to forgive their wickedness, to turn away from it all, and to live in the light, to turn away. And that is the Lord dealing with evil. He's judged it, and on the, upon the return of Jesus, that is when ultimate justice is coming. It's called the, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Great because Jesus is coming back. Dreadful because if you've devoted your life to being his enemy, it is going to be a severely bad time for you. Now, the impossible besides God, otherwise, Je Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies by virtue of being born alone that it would have had been impossible for Jesus to have any hand in it apart from being the only son of God. Jesus was actively obedient in his sinless life to the point of sweating blood in his, in, his, in his fight against the temptation, against the forces of evil in the heavenly realms for our sake. And then that just wrath of God on all of the evil that ever was, was poured out on him. All the evil that ever was, all the evil that ever is, all the evil that ever will be, poured out on Jesus in a single moment. It's like, it's like the apex of time, the apex of salvation, the, 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 a time just for this, the, the, the culmination of the Lord's plan for the salvation of mankind, poured out and killed his only son which has made salvation accessible to everyone. Almost seemingly too accessible. This is too easy. It's too easy to get right for God. All you got to say, all I got to do is put my belief and trust and love Jesus and I can be forgiven of every sin ever. That's too easy. There surely has to be something I can do. There's got to be a check I could write. There's got to be a chair I can pick up and relocate. There's got to be something I can do, Lord. Salvation is so accessible because it costs God everything. It costs God the life of his only son. It costs God something precious. And us, as mankind, we have a severely limited perspective. And that's okay. Because as we walk, as we go along our Christian walk, people are going to have hard questions. And it's okay to, for people to have hard questions as long as you have a heart of love when they're asking you those questions. I got to preach a little bit of a redaction. We were talking about Augustine's confessions because, whoa, that, that crowd reaction was fantastic because it was, okay, I heard that. I heard that from the heart. We said, well, where, what was God building before he made creation? And, and part of the, the answer was, oh, well, God was building hell for people that asked those questions. Everyone went, oh, oh, what? Oh, no. You know, like, because, and, but Augustine, in more context, said, I would never answer somebody that way. I would never say that to somebody. I would even say, I don't know. I don't know. And it's okay not to have those kinds of answers because we're not God. It's about having a heart of love. People are going to ask hard questions about Jesus because Jesus, everything Jesus did, he tested our hearts. He challenged us. Jesus said seemingly offensive things. Things that offend people even to this day. And I remember growing up and, and, and participating in youth group. And young people have fantastic questions. And I love that they ask them. 
because they're they're earnest and they're bold and they're so honest and they're and they're then they don't have as much you know insecurity to to worry about how they how they might look for asking the questions and there's a question where they talk the verse about Jesus and the the woman following him is asking Jesus for mercy and he says uh, the 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 dog shouldn't get the children's bread you know and she said but the dogs get the crumbs under the table and he said for that answer you're forgiven right and then the, the question was wait so are all Gentiles dogs are we just a bunch of Yorkies under a table begging for scraps that's not the point of Jesus' answer. Jesus is fulfilling a promise that he made to his people that he would come to the Jewish people first and then the Gentiles. But it's an honest question. It comes from a place where you care. You care what Jesus thinks. You care about the mind of Christ. And that's the heart we're supposed to have. Jesus called the religious leaders of the day whitewashed tombs. He said, you're beautiful, but you are dead inside. These people wanted to kill him. He said offensive things to them. And then we had the, and his disciples and the people following who said, Jesus, isn't this building amazing? Aren't these pillars fantastic? Isn't this, fan, isn't this building amazing? And people get weird about buildings, all right? People get weird about this building. I get weird about this building, right? It's hard not to get weird about buildings. And Jesus says, yeah, you like this building? I'm going to break it, right? I'm going to tear this whole thing down from top to bottom and I'm going to rebuild it in three days. And everybody who thought the building was the most important got real mad about that answer. They said, how dare you? How dare you offend the building? How dare you say you're going to tear down the building? You're crazy, okay? And these are the kinds of things that Jesus says to a world that desperately need him. A world whose hearts are so misoriented on things that can never save them and never fulfill them and never love them that he had he had to come here he had to fulfill his mission and we we, we we live our life with a lot of insecurity the world is constantly trying to misorient us you know I str we struggle with it ourselves you know it's hard to it's easy to, to think something like oh you know what my life is just so messy physically and emotionally and XYZ to just invite people into it. Like, we can't have people over. There's a sock on the floor. They're going to know that we don't love Jesus as much as we should, you know? And we really think that that is going to happen. Like, I've never been over someone's house and saw, like, a sock on the floor and went, wow, their relationship is with God is terrible. Or, you know, like, wow, somebody hates the Lord. Like, no! These are, these are narratives that we spin in our head. Do you know why bullying is so effective? In making our lives miserable because a bully will say something mean to you right a bully will say well you're an, an, an empty-headed ninny muggins right one time and then you will go home and you will have a conversation with yourself about what that bully said until you believe it you know and you're like wow I am a cotton-headed ninny muggins right because you're believing a lie you are digesting and choosing to have a lie conversation with yourself about something that isn't true the Lord wants us to have a conversation with ourselves about the truth, about who he says that we are, about who he says uh, what he has done for us. Not, not what the bullies and the liars and the thieves say. It's about what the Lord has to say, say to us. He wants to take us from the kingdom of darkness and transfer us to the... For, it's, it's right here, right? It's a side. For he has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, where we don't have to have this orphan spirit anymore, right? We are, we are God's children. We represent his kingdom. Our thoughts should be on the truth and not lies. So now we are part of the kingdom of heaven, and it's this wonderful divine mystery that we should always be peering into. Scripture says that, angels long to look into these things and it's kind of a wild thing to kind of even try to wrap our heads around like do angels not have the Bible you know do are angels so busy that they don't have scripture you know I don't know the perspective of angels I have no idea what their work situations is I don't know when they clock in when they clock out I don't know what is going on with angels at all but I know what's going on with us and I know that the Lord has told us that the angels long to look into God's master plan for our salvation. That is wild. That is wild to think about. 
And we shouldn't take it for granted. This is another way the Lord is telling us that we should never take it for granted. We are so blessed to have oftentimes more Bibles in this room than we do people. And we should not take, we shouldn't take that for granted. We absolutely not, you know, it might be the most sold book in the entire world. It ha- but it has to be read. It has to be looked into. It has to be understood. Isaiah chapter 45, starting in verse 8 reads, Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. There is no other God besides the Lord. And I started a little too, uh, I started in verse 8, verse 5, because I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. You could ask a hundred questions about those verses, about what that means. And we as a church should not stop trying to understand. I mean, we love our children. We don't stop loving our children, but we especially love our children when they're small. And they can't possibly understand anything by grasp. By, our small children can't understand anything by comparison, right? We're like in a completely different galaxy compared to them. This morning, Audrey wished me Happy Mother's Day twice, right? Okay. And I said, no, it's Happy Father's Day. She went, Happy Mother's Day. And then she said it, and she said, Happy Father's Day. I said, good job. And then she continued to wish me Happy Mother's Day the rest of the morning, okay? Because she's two, okay? We, likewise, are like spiritual infants. And how much more to us is, like, is the Lord like a parent to small babies, all right? Because <laughs> it's Father's Day. And it's okay not to understand everything the first time you hear or read it. That was a really important bit of wisdom that they, I got when I was really early in my Christian walk. I was like, sometimes I read the Bible and I just don't get it. You know, like, I was just like, I hit a wall and I'm like, what does that mean? And they're like, it's okay. You know, it's like walking and you're like, that's a big rock. Walk around the rock. All right. Sometimes you need more context. Sometimes you need to know your father a little better before you're going to understand that verse. Sure enough, turned out to be true. And thank goodness for that, because discouragement is very powerful, it can be almost as powerful as encouragement. And what's a little confusing, but really wonderful about the Christian walk, is that it's inconsistent, but our Lord is consistent. It's kind of like exercise, right? I lost a lot of weight. I was like extremely big, extremely big. It was the biggest I ever was. And then suddenly, by a lot of goofy confusion, I started running, and I started running outside. Because I was running literal circles in that workshop, and I thought, this is crazy. Why don't I run outside? There's more things to see. And I lost a lot of weight as a result of walking outside. It was a lot harder, and then a time came where I didn't run as much, and then I had access to a treadmill, and I thought, oh, I'll just run on the treadmill. And I tell you the truth, (laughs) the treadmill did nothing for me, okay? Because the treadmill goes at one speed, at one elevation, And as soon as my body started to realize that this is the soup of the day, it just, my body got used to doing it as efficiently as possible. Didn't challenge me in any way. The key, the the reason running outside is more beneficial than running on a treadmill is because it's inconsistent. The elevation is always changing. The wind is always changing. Everything around you, despite seeming pretty innocuous, is always changing. You got to get out of the way of cars. The wind is changing. The elevation is changing. You get tired. The direction changes. And it's that inconsistently, it's that constant challenge that grows you. And likewise, we are, are constantly challenged by not only outside forces, 
but by, you know, we're challenged by our, our own in intellect. We're, con we're challenged uh, by the fact that we, we don't know everything, but our Lord is consistent. We can always rely on Him. And so another, another piece of wisdom that was super helpful to me uh, early on, when I was getting really good at telling myself that I was the worst Christian on the planet, and, that they, and it wasn't in the form of an answer, it was in the form of a question. They said, have you ever yelled at a baby trying to walk? And I laughed. I was like, that's insane. Why would you yell at a baby? <laughs> and they're like, exactly. This thing, when, a, when you see a baby walk, like, three steps and then fall down, you don't go, you knucklehead, you know? Nobody's, I've never seen somebody berate a baby for, for failing to walk, right? But what happens when you see a baby do anything right? You cheer, right? You celebrate. You get excited. Everybody, everybody gets all up. Everybody goes, loses their mind. They're like, the baby's walking. Oh, the baby's talking. Oh, the baby's learning how to use a fork. Oh, oh, the baby's trying to put the fork in the, in the light switch, right? You know, it's like, every time the baby does something right, it's a celebration. But when the baby does something wrong, there's no condemnation. And that's what the church of Christ ought to be. When we're doing something right, when we're growing, it ought to be... An encouragement. It ought to be a celebration. And that's, that's what the situation is. <clears throat> and as I was a child, we talk about having a ready answer. And this was like an on and off, not really a joke, but something we always played with the idea of doing was, and apparently they did it years before I was even at this church, where they was called the Have a Ready Answer Sermon Series, right? And they said, okay, we're going to have, everybody is going to pick a sermon, they're going to preach a sermon, you're going to give us a title, it's going to, and we're going, to have an, we're going to have a picture on the PowerPoint, and whoever is preaching is not going to know that they're up to preach until that Sunday morning. And half of the room was like, whoa, no, 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 that sounds like a nightmare. Are you kidding me? I got to, I got to be fresh up on my sermon notes six weeks in a, you know, in a row. And, and the other half of the room was like, yeah, that sounds fun. Yeah, why not? Let's do it, right? And it's... <laughs> So, and, you know, so it, it was, but we, we should have a ready answer at all times. We should be able to talk about spiritual things at all times, whether or not we, we have a perfect answer every single time. And I remember as a child, I had to have ready answers for things. And, I, and it's something that, that came to me recently because we talk about, you know, staying sharp and iron sharpens iron and, and being well quite acquainted with the scriptures. As a child, there were some things I absolutely had to know that got drilled into my head every single day. I had to know how to call 911, right? I had to know what my address was, and I had to know and also be able to say to strangers that I'm not allowed to talk to them, right? That was something that was drilled in my head constantly to tell people, I am not allowed to talk to strangers. I'm sorry, but we can't have a relationship, right? <laughs> I'm five years old. And as I think back of it, I needed to know how to protect myself because I had people that cared for me in my life I needed to know who I am, where I came from, and I needed to know how to ask for help. And these are things that were impressed upon me as a child. And as Christians, there's, there's no different. You need to know who you are in Christ. You need to know who you are a citizen of. You need to know how to ask for help, okay? These are important things to the Christian. The Christian that doesn't know how to ask for help is a miserable Christian, right? Is a Christian that is going to be spinning their tires in the, in the muddy swamp of frust frustration until Jesus comes back. And I'm telling you, that is no way to live. And we want to equip you as a church, as, as, as leaders, to, to not be stuck in the mud, not be spinning your tires. We, we were part of a, a church organization for several years called Great Commission Churches. Most of you know who they are. And one of the pillars of Great Commission Church, his name was Herschel Martindale, and he passed away recently. It was about a week, week or two ago. And one of his most powerful, most impactful s stories that we were blessed with being able to hear was uh, he was what was considered to be a very successful pastor in his time. He had a big church in Texas. I feel like if you have a church in Texas, it's always big, you know, by default. And, but he had a big church, and he was, doing, he was doing well for himself. And he went to a conference for other pastors, and this gentleman <clears throat> asked him 
He said, do, he went to each table and his table, he went to his table and he said, do you believe that God wants to reach the entire world in this generation? And all of them are pastors, so obviously the answer can't be no, right? And they went, yeah, we do believe that the Lord wants to reach the whole, the ends of the earth in this generation. And then he asked this question. He said, if every Christian were doing what you are doing, would the whole world be reached in this generation? And then Herschel left the conference. He didn't finish the conference. He walked into a field and he wept before the Lord. And he just, he said it was just, it was the most emotionally raw experience of his life. You know, he said it was the most gutting question he had ever heard in his entire life because the answer was no, you know. And for a lot of people, the answer was no. You know, if every Christian was doing what I'm, what I'm doing, would the world be reached? No. But then, but the story didn't end there. He asked the Lord, he said, just tell me where you want me to go, Lord. Tell me what you want me to do. And he made a lot of radical changes in his life. And as, as a result, he, you know, got to be part of a lot of flourishing ministries. He got to be part of the, the founding of Great Commission churches, which blessed me and a lot of other people in enormous ways. So... The way that we purify our souls, uh, as said to us in Scripture in First Peter, is that we are obedient to the truth. That's how you purify your soul. You're obedient to the truth. Because First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 says, He who calls you to be holy... Well, you know what? I'll give it to you right from, right from the Scriptures. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. The second most powerful thing, a <laughs> piece of wisdom that, that Herschel imparted with people uh, before he passed on, that I have written down on so many pieces of paper over the course of my life, because every time I heard it, I had to write it down. I, I was like, I, if I don't write this down, I'm going to regret it forever. <laughs> and I, every time I've heard it, I've written it down. He said that all that God is, is available to those that are available to all that God is. Right? Yeah. It's kind of a tongue twister, right? You got you to gotta say it like to yourself slow. Because the first time he said it, I was like, wait. You know, like my brain was like a circuit board. It's, you know, like I blew a fuse. All that God is is available to those that are available to all that God is. I was kicking myself. One of the props that I want, I wanted to bring out that big, funny Italian chalkboard menu, and I wanted, right under menu, I wanted to write salvation, redemption, goodness, kindness, all of the fruits of the Spirit, because when you are available to all that God is, all of the fruits of the Spirit are yours. All these things, like all these good things that God wants for you are yours. All the things that we really need a lot of are self-control, love, goodness, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. All of those things can be yours in spades, all right? If you're just available to it. If you're just available to it. You can't be like, yeah, I know where all this goodness is. If I could just find the time to put the keys in the car, you know? But it's like it doesn't have to be that way. So next week... We're going to be talking about a lot of good and fair questions that people that you know refer to as you know the lost or, or non-believers have. And what's kind of wonderful is that those who don't know the Lord, they kind of always have the same five questions. And if you can kind of keep five kind of seemingly seeming simple answers in your head, uh, it'll not only help you maintain a stronger understanding that will help you in turn understand scripture but it'll also be helpful for ministering to people that you we love in the kingdom of heaven you know i've never been into i don't i don't know anyone that was intellectually impressed into the kingdom although i'm sure that has happened but we especially this church you know that's something that uh, we've always heard for a long time is that we are extremely blessed in, the, in terms of having a strong family spirit. I tell you, I've been to other services, I've been to other churches, I've been to a lot of churches like out in other states, and I've, that believe the same things that we do. And I've been to beginning to end, I even stayed late, no one said hi to me, no one has shook my hand, you know? 
And I'm like, man, I miss my church, you know? Like, I get this is probably our sister, but I miss my church. I miss my family. I miss, you know, I want, and I, you know, and when we have guests, you know, I don't know, sometimes I'm like, you know, there's like 10 people around them on, on, in a minute, you know, but I'm like, we're warm. We love you. We want you to know that you're welcome. We want you to know that we care about you because the Lord cared for us first and our cups are overflowing and we want you to know that there's a lot, there's a lot of love in this room and there's a lot of love to share and we're going to continue to share it and as we are obedient to the truth, I believe more amazing opportunities are going to happen in this church and, and it's just a terribly exciting time. So, you know, don't miss out. Be available to all that God is. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for being our Father. We thank you for being so wholly true to your character and that please increase our faith. Please help us to be available to all that you are. Please help us to, to put away all of our baggage and to be excited about the things that you are doing. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we don't get us right. Get it right. And just continue to conform us to the image of Jesus. Thank you for being so patient with us. Thank you for being so patient with bitterness and discouragement. And thank you for being faithful and true to complete the work that you started in each and every person in this room. Father, we pray for those that don't know you. We pray that they would, they would have a change of heart. They would have a, 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 miracle, a miraculously new heart that comes from you. And that they would decide today, if not tomorrow... The Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you with everything. And I'm not going to have any regrets. Because I know that you can do it. Because what's impossible here and now with man is never impossible with you. We love you. We thank you. We always lift this time up to you when we pray that our, our music, that our voices would be a fragrant offering to you with thankful, appreciative hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.